So yes, I'll be talking about uh, Henry Neville Hutchinson. It's probably, if you've talked to me yesterday, you'll be wondering if I've stopped talking about Henry Neville Hutchinson, but I'm going to do it a little bit more systematically. Okay, so the Reverend Henry Neville Hutchinson's Extinct Monsters, a generously illustrated book of lucid paleontological popularization, was a trend-setting text, and Creatures of Other Days bolstered his fame. Reviewing the new edition in 1910 in Nature, the gentleman naturalist Richard Lydica reflected that Hutchinson was the first to recognize that the larger extinct animals of former ages presented a promising field for a popular work, and had thus, quote, filled a gap in literature. Considering the fact that, as historians Mark Rudwick and Ralph O'Connor have demonstrated, depicting prehistoric life in entertaining scientific literature was common from the beginning of the 19th century, why did Lydica think Hutchinson was so innovative? Uh, Hutchinson being just a clergyman and a professional writer, really. So this paper like to look at this question by uh, analyzing the manner in which Hutchinson produced texts that used the latest developments in paleontology, collaborating with the staff of the Naturalist Museum in South Kensington for their expertise and for materials, and focusing greater attention to the popularizing power of illustration and three-dimensional models. And so, so Hutchinson's sort of somewhat eccentric relationship with the NHM staff in London was a vital element in generating his precarious scientific authority. And through his book's successes with both popular audiences and actually institutional paleontologists, Hutchinson was a key figure in instigating a surge in popular paleontological literature at the turn of the 20th century. So, popular paleontological popular paleontological literature had not kept up with the great fossil discoveries of the late 19th century by men like O.C. Marsh and E.D. Cope. Even revised editions of the leading tomes of the popular geology genre, like Figuier's best-selling, intricately illustrated Le Terre avant le Deluge, were increasingly outdated. You could still get uh, Le Terre avant le Deluge in English in the 1890s, um, especially in the English language, where a lot of books were coming out in France but not being translated. The Athenaeum observed that while, quote, many of our extinct monsters were long ago introduced to the reading public, the Jurassic Saurians, for example, by Buckland, and the Wheeled and Dinosaurs by Mantle, quote, most people in this country know nothing of the remarkable discoveries of Marsh and Cope and Leedy in the rocks of the Wild West. Unlike geologists William Buckland and Gideon Mantle in earlier decades, the war in Cope and Marsh had little time for popularization. With several decades of groundbreaking discoveries diffused across their expensive monographs, and a scientific transaction, there was a significant gap in the transatlantic literary market for a sophisticated, respectable, and up-to-date book about paleontology. So the development of Hutchinson personally's interest in popularization can be tracked with pretty interesting clarity. His father was science master at rugby school, where Hutchinson was, quote, brought up in an atmosphere of laboratories and science generally. His geology was cultivated, taking his bachelor's at St. John's College, Cambridge, and after graduating, he worked as the assistant master in Clifton College, Bristol which at the time was unusual in emphasizing scientific education. He became a priest in 1885, but an unspecified and slightly suspicious illness caused him to step down. And as a geological society, society a bitterist observed, quote, the expository power which his ill health lost to the church was a gain to science. In 1890, Hutchinson arrived in London to begin a journalistic career in science writing. And so from Westminster, he cultivated a relationship with the staff at the NHM in South Kensington. Hutchinson, along with his artist, natural history painter Joseph Smith, visited the Department of Geology constantly from May of 1892, following Chapman and Hall's decision to publish the book the previous month. Now, Hutchinson was somewhat a bit of a fixture in the visitor's book of the NHM. And his books focus on prehistoric life rather than geology or biblical reconciliation or evolutionary epic narratives differentiated his books from those of his predecessors. More crucially, Hutchinson's books were extensively illustrated by luxurious lithographs of lifelike extinct animals utilizing the latest skeletal reconstructions. So recent discoveries have provided an unprecedented quantity of these near-complete skeletons that were uh, ripe for reassembly. Marsh had published them prolifically, but uh, of all the leading paleontologists, he was perhaps the most opposed to what he called the kindergarten science of lifelike restorations. Hutchinson didn't really care what Marsh thought. By scrutinizing the literature and observing specimens at the NHM, Hutchinson and Smith transformed the skeletal reconstructions and some actual material into restorations with an anatomical fidelity and austere composition which contrasted dramatically with romantic scenes from deep time, such as those by Figuier's Le Terre avant le Deluge. And after Hutchinson's first well-received book, Marsh saw his works were going to be popularized whether he liked it or not, and gave Hutchinson considerable assistance, as did various other paleontologists. So from the four, extinct monsters' informal affiliations with the NHM were emphasized. The preface by the Keeper of Geology, Henry Woodward, called Smith's illustrations, quote, the happiest set of restorations that has yet appeared. The book was also possible to read as an accompaniment to the museum's guidebook, 
uh, the closest thing to popularization funded by the trustees. And Hutchinson therefore frequently referred readers in his book to particular installations in the museum. Hutchinson's texts also provided occasional gentle correctives to misleading material in the museum. A lifelike restoration of the giant mammal Dinotherium, which hung by the animal's fossil bones, quote, does not agree with the actual specimen close by. And so Smith's new restoration would, Hutchinson hoped, give a more correct idea. These books performed important expansory functions which the official guides, limited to text and skeletal diagrams, could not. Visitors, Hutchinson claimed, pass hastily by the cases of bones, teeth, and skeletons, quote, as they do not know how to interpret them, preferring instead, quote, the more attractive collection of stuffed birds on the other side. In 1892, most of the fossils on display were these sort of fragmented bones or in more crowd-pleasing cases, skulls. Um, printed skeletal reconstructions were sometimes hung in the galleries, often pictures of photos of the American Museum. But restoration imagery, like the flawed Dinotherium that Hutchinson criticized, was much rarer in this time. The Dinoceros given by Marsh was one of the museum's few recent freestanding fossil skeletons. Most of the others were fairly aged, such as the Megatherium you can see there, the Mastodon, the Moa, and the Irish Deer. So not many American specimens. Despite their scarcity, Hutchinson considered these freestanding skeletal sources held together by armatures to be the optimum subjects for lifelike restorations. Such arrangements, he explained, make the collection intelligible and interesting to the general public and give one a much better idea than when all the bones are lying huddled together on a slab of rock. The museum's mounted plesiosaur, Dinoceros and Megatherium skeletons became three subjects of papier-mâché models used in Hutchinson's Touring Extinct Monsters lecture series. Hutchinson posted a Dinoceros to Marsh which broke in the mail and boasted elsewhere that the plesiosaurus model is unique because made from the only skeleton of that animal that has ever been set up like that of a living animal and so it shows for the first time the true shape. The public like models such as these, he later insisted, in an attempt to persuade the keeper of geology to place his model of Pelanoistes philarchus by the skeleton in the gallery, for they really do help them. It therefore seemed, quote, a pity to bury them away in your library. And uh, I'm a bit confused because this certainly looks like his model of Pelanoistes. This is the cover of the NHM, but it, his paper described as 23 inches long, which is definitely easy. But this was certainly on display uh, in the galleries. Whether or not it's actually the same model or not, it's certainly very, very similar. And you can see his diplodocus on top. Um, the diplodocus certainly was not displayed because it provocatively contradicted the straight legged skeleton in the gallery, which Hutchinson audaciously told the keeper that he would like to see changed to match his model. Also, there's a triceratops down the bottom, which is definitely based on Smith's, but I have no idea where it comes from. Improving the NHM's user interface was one of Hutchinson's chief aims. As Carl Yanni has shown, modernizing organs of science such as nature were critical of Alfred Waterhouse's gloomy Romanesque design of the museum. The ornate interior cast distracting shadows across collections, limited floor space. Hutchinson was well aware of these shortcomings. As he observed, thanks to the lack of gas or electric lighting, the collections were left in darkness whenever London fog prevails and the numbers of citizens are turned away in disgust, with the result that during winter, quote, a good day's work becomes impossible. Hutchinson prayed for the day when, quote, the government of this country will no longer trust in its present careless way to private enterprise and liberality for the furthering of scientific discovery, and the treasury will see to it that lighting be installed in the galleries. Hutchinson's texts, however, were able to function as guides to a more idealized museum. Smith's exacting restorations provided the antidote to foggy, shadow-dappled cabinets. These of bright, monochrome illustrations typically depict the extinct subjects laterally, plain sight, supplemented by a second, maybe more distant example at a different angle. The plates were always accompanied, almost always accompanied, by the relevant skeletal reconstruction and woodcut nearby, so the careful reader could assess the restoration's accuracy. The revised edition further improved upon this quality of the other plates, as you can see in the minute changes made here for 1893, and paired restorations that originally didn't have a skeletal reconstruction with a skeletal reconstruction. The Manchester Guardian flatteringly noted these things, saying, it saw the unusual attention to scientific accuracy that made Smith's restorations, quote, worthy of a place in a gallery of any public museum. Moreover, it acknowledged that side by side with these are woodcuts of the skeletons of the same animals for the benefit of those readers who wish to penetrate a little below the surface. But by the second decade of the 20th century, Hutchinson's faith in the ability of non-specialists to engage with science had shrunk. In 1910, when his two books on paleontology were abridged and combined into a new work, Hutchinson described the process as skimming samples of cream from many bowls of milk, his increasingly pessimistic stance being that it is only the cream that the general public require. For popularization, then, illustrations, models, and freestanding skeletons were more important than ever. As the geological magazines review <coughs> observed, the Diplodocus cast that arrived from the museum in 1905 was, quote, an animal that involuntarily did so much to popularize paleontology. 
Extinct Monsters and Creatures of Other Days, which is the 1910 title, and uh, all the previous books enjoyed a uniformly, almost uniformly positive reception in non-specialist periodicals and newspapers, and even specialist newspapers and periodicals, well, specialist periodicals, soberly welcomed it. One reviewer, however, was intent on denying Hutchinson his right to popularize the work of others. Melinda Baldwin has shown that in the pages of the periodical Nature, contributors and editors were erecting, quote, the boundaries that defined who would be excluded, and first-hand investigation was becoming increasingly the vital definition of who was a man of science. Hutchinson's text became a front line in this conflict. Bernard Lightman's already highlighted Nature's argument that Hutchinson went beyond the remit of the popular writer and what he said. I would go further and say Nature's reviewer, Harry Govia Seeley, was a paleontologist whose nomenclature and biology Hutchinson repeatedly and kind of casually subordinated. The confident Hutchinson in general showed little deference to his sources, although he often softened his disagreements with a conciliatory, very reasonable and friendly tone. But what disturbed Seeley was Hutchinson's reliance on the American Marsh's skeletal reconstructions and classifications, which Seeley did not wish to see, quote, handed on to the unlearned, in preference, presumably, to Seeley's own theories. Divorcing the Reverend entirely from any claim to scientific activity, he patronizingly commended the book for being clearly and simply written without any pretense of being scientific and for demonstrating an excellent capacity for quotation. Subsequently, Seeley undermined the very foundations of the second book, Creatures of Other Days, by declaring it, quote, a work of literature rather than science, yet which was still, quote, so full of reference to scientific facts and discoveries, but it appears like a work of learning. Seeley perceived the vulgarization of the thin scientific papers into novelistic entertainment to be an arrogant trespassing into the scientific domain, employing, quote, no critical digest of the facts, whilst accepting, quote, impartially material which any author has supplied. Presumably it meant Marsh more than any author. For several organs with fewer concerns about these kind of epistemological matters regarding the nature of the true man of science, the issue was simpler. Hutchinson was plainly, quote, an eminent scientist. The transcriber of the geology department's visitors book struggled to pin down exactly who he was as well. For the most part, he was correctly reverend. Sometimes he was mister, and occasionally he was doctor. He certainly wasn't actually a doctor. As the trends of the 20th century increasingly excluded non-practitioners from the scientific community, Hutchinson continued to insist on a Victorian idea of, ideal of gentlemanly contribution based largely on second-hand reading. In 1917, he privately complained to A.S. Woodward that the, quote, pedantic style of the leading geological magazine was now, quote, far beyond the reach of the ordinary geologist. His outburst was specifically a response to the germ rejection of his paper on the dinosaur Diplodocus carnegii. Hutchinson, somewhat of a Germanophile, had proposed a stooped reconstruction you saw earlier, Diplodocus, inspired possibly by Prussian zoologist Gustav Tornier. But the geological magazine apparently objected to the paper's strangely anti-authoritarian views upon science. And you can see there, as you say, my scheme is not science, but that is just why I'm doing it. Science make a mistake in keeping knowledge in watertight compartments. The mystery of evolution will never be solved by the pure scientist, he continued, but rather it wants the help of the poet and the philosopher. And he goes on to talk about Swedenborg. Henry Woodward and A.S. Woodward apparently took sympathy on the Reverend this time, and his article was reconsidered and published soon after. But Henry Woodward convinced Hutchinson of the need for further editing and forced a subtle concession that he, Hutchinson, lacked a certain scientific depth. Published two months later, however, the paper by Reverend H. N. Hutchinson, M.A., F.R.G.S., F.G.S., F.Z.S., etc., showed little signs of having been altered to suit the drier pages of the geological magazine at all. Although the paper was long and anatomical, the exclamation mark the laden tone continued the rhetoric of his popular texts and included lots of things like things like put a, a, a handkerchief on your arm and see if it falls off and that's why that proves something about like those uh, ligaments. So he kind of entirely ignored the geological magazine's highly specialist, fairly austere readership. Nonetheless, the fairly critical analytical article on Diplodocus effectively refuted many of Seeley's damaging attacks on his scientific capacity and judgment uh, between different material. So this ambiguous article in 1917 was Hutchinson's first paper of original research in a scientific periodical at age 61. But even at the end of his life, Hutchinson voiced idiosyncratic criticisms of the direction taken by Natural History Museum public policy. On Boxing Day 1926, he privately attacked the scientific accuracy of the museum's set of postcards, which featured charcoal sketches of prehistoric animals by Alice B. Woodward. Hutchinson questioned the credentials of Alice Woodward, daughter of Henry Woodward, and the leading prehistoric artist of the early 20th century, well known for illustrating works like Nebula to Man and Evolution in the Past. He particularly disliked Hercetiosaurus, and we know this because he said, I do not like Hercetiosaurus. <laughs> Lamenting, he said, that she has not studied their bones evidently, or she would give them more flesh. He nostalgically added, some of dear old Smith's restorations are more correct, testily adding to, I'll give her a few hints if she cares to consult me. 
The department curator, W.E. Swinton, to whom Hutchinson's irate letter was directed, was dismissive of the aged popularizer, pointing out that, quote, Miss Woodward drew them under the direction of Professor Watson and myself, and so they cannot be very far wrong. Thank you. This flippant remark, in fact, echoed the official leaflet published with the postcards, which said uh, the restorations were, quote, probably not very far from the truth. Hutchinson's claims through our scientific authority were precarious, but it undoubtedly been a key figure in rejuvenating paleontologic popularization, at least in Anglo-America. Frederick A. Lucas, curator of comparative anatomy at the US National Museum, Smithsonian, was the first institutional paleontologist to attribute inspiration directly to Hutchinson. In 1901, when Hutt Lucas produced his own uh, important popular work, he felt obliged to admit its attractive form was somewhat on the lines of Hutchinson's, but with books out of the boats, however, he declared it a good plan to build after a good model. And you can sort of see the similarities in the formatting here with the restoration of the poetic quote, size of the text, and even almost the same chapter number. Well, I think it's a coincidence. Lucas's next book continued to acknowledge Hutchinson as a popular authority and even used several of Smith's restorations due to sharing the same publisher. Although London Museum Director E. Ray Lancaster did not credit Hutchinson so openly, the title and content of his Extinct Animals could hardly have failed to recall the Reverend's book, Extinct Monsters, and the replacement of monsters with animals was a significant one. A keen popularizer who compiled this children's book out of a 1903 lecture series at Christmas, Lancaster nonetheless, nonetheless had strong feelings about who had the right to popularize science and how to do so. His book railed at those popularizers like Hutchinson whose rhetoric blurred science and fairy tales, arguing that, quote, the wonderful things which science reveals to us are altogether remote from fairy tales. Despite the friendly tone of extinct animals, Lancaster therefore felt the need to stress clearly the illusion which Hutchinson and many previous early Victorian popularizers conceived as existing between science and fairy tales was not a useful one, especially not to give to children. At the same time as Lancaster's book was in production, however, an extra departmental figure with literary ideals closer to Hutchinson was researching his own popular tome in the department. Henry R. Knipe, you can see there, I don't think this is often reproduced, I don't know what he looked like until very recently, a former barrister and genteel philanthropist of Tunbridge Wells, thanked Hutchinson for sharing, quote, his wide scientific knowledge in many useful criticisms and suggestions for the benefit of his sophisticated but eccentric evolutionary epic poem, Nebula to Man, 1905 in addition to rendering, quote, much assistance in working out restorations of extinct animals. In fact, Hutchinson appears to introduce Knipe in person to the department. The production of Knipe's luxurious quarter, which cost a guinea, featured 71 well-illustrated plates, many by Smith and Alice Woodward, clearly revealed the extent of the capable networks between paleontologists, artists, and popularizers that had kind of been fortified during the creation of extinct monsters. In 1931, a year before extinct monsters creatures of other days, the last copies were bound, Hutchinson was already dead, the NHM curator Swinton published the first of the works that would see him become the mid-century uh, NHM's and mid-century Britain's really most prominent popularizer. This early venture enjoyed the Hutchinsonian title, Monsters of Primeval Days. The title was not the only Victorian echo. Swinton's amiable tone, formatting, and his artist's placid scenes differed negligibly from the presentation pioneered by extinct monsters. And certain images showed uh, direct consultation, we'll call it that charitably. Hutchinson's groundbreaking contributions to the genre of popular paleontology subtly steered its trajectory in Britain, superficially and structurally, and by the 1950s, some were published by the trustees of the NHM themselves. Of course, the situation was completely different by post-war um, in terms of knowledge of dinosaurs, thanks to cinema. So although his attempts to contribute original research to paleontology and his conclusions on critical debates had little significant impact to mainstream scientific thought, Hutchinson was a major and authoritative figure in British natural history in the decades around 1900. His personal relationship with important figures in the naturalistic community, like the Woodwards, many of them, meant that his lack of a professional scientific position did not force him out of the scientific community. And they scaffolded his determinedly mid-Victorian conception of science as open to all who are willing to participate, to a level. I'll end with the words of a geological scientist obituarist who remarked that Hutchinson was, quote, a familiar face to our gatherings, known at least by name, to a far wider circle than most of which we can reach. His popular works on extinct monsters and the like are familiar to us all, but all may not realize what real pains he took to get his facts at first hand and from the best authorities. That's uh, 1928, I think. Thank you.